Dr. Mukdesi is a professor of English and Comparative Literature at UCLA and the author of Romantic Imperialism, William Blake and the Impossible History of the 1790s, and Palestine Inside Out, an Everyday Occupation, which I recommend uh, to all of you as reading on uh, the question of uh, Palestine. He is currently completing work on a book tentatively called Occidentalism, Race, and Imperial Culture, which explores the convergence between the civilizing mission into which the British Empire would morph in the 19th century and almost exactly parallel mission inside England uh, itself. He received his PhD from the literature program at Duke University in 1993 and his BA from Wesleyan University in 1987. Um, we're going to have the lecture and then a question and answer session for all those watching the live stream online. Uh, you can participate as well. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our Edward Said Memorial Lecturer today, Dr. Sari Mukhtasi. Thank you all for coming. It's, of course, an honor for me to present uh, this year's Palestine Center Lecture in honor of the memory of Edward Said, whose presence in the past few years many of us have missed, never more urgently, I think, than now when the Palestinian people and cause seem to have entered a critical juncture. In moments of crisis, such as the present, he always seemed to know best how to cut through the smokescreen of empty platitudes and misleading discourses and keep his and our eyes focused on the realities and aspirations that those discourses often successfully obscured. Even if it will undoubtedly fall short of the standard uh, Edward established, the lecture I would like to offer you today is very much in his spirit, in every sense of that term. His work on Palestine was so distinctive from the work of conventional political analysts and was, as a result, I think, so vitally important to so many people around the world because it operated at two different levels at once. On the one hand, addressing with crystalline clarity and clinical precision the urgent questions confronting us in the stark, naked reality of the present, while, on the other hand, always deriving its energy and its sense of purpose from the plenitude kept alive in the realm of ideas, aspirations, rights, and universal concepts such as justice, the realm to which we might refer as the imaginative and even the literary, notions to which I'll return a little later on today. Let me just anticipate my conclusion by saying that what made Edwards' work so valuable to so many people around the world was the simple fact that he refused to relinquish his attachment to the realm of ideas and ideals to which more conventional analysts rarely pay the proper or even sometimes any attention. And he did so not simply because he was a literary man through and through, although he was, but because he understood so well that it is at our peril that we give up on the vital role that the imagination plays in any political struggle. That the realm of ideas and the imagination is of such vital importance was illustrated most recently by, of all people, and personally I'm very surprised by this myself, Mahmoud Abbas, in the speech he gave recently at the United Nations General Assembly. Even many of us who have long been critical of Mr. Abbas had to admit that the speech was at many levels a stirring event. And the element that made it stand out, it seems to me, was precisely its inclusion of that imaginative and compassionate register usually totally absent from Abbas's speeches. As, for example, most notably, probably, when he spoke of the Nakba of 1948 and recalled so vividly to our imaginations the experiences of those like himself who were, to use his words, and I quote him, forced to leave their homes and their towns and villages, carrying only some of our belongings and our grief and our memories and the keys of our homes to the camps of exile and the diaspora. The standing ovations which Mr. Abbas received were not for him, really, but really for the extent to which he conveyed the story of Palestine. And I want to emphasize that it is a story that he was conveying to the single most important global audience ever, the General Assembly of the United Nations. What made Abbas's speech so convincing is that it, ar it articulated all the main themes of the Palestinian narrative, the destruction and dispersal of 1948, the inalienable right of those expelled in that year to return to their homes and land, 
the right of the Palestinian people to freedom from military occupation and to freedom from institutionalized apartheid, both in pre-1967 Israel and in the territories occupied and colonized in that year, and in general to self-determination in their native land. What was important about the Palestinian bid at the UN then was its reassertion of Palestinian autonomy and agency, an insistence not only on the right to narrate the story of Palestine and the Palestinians to a global audience, but also on the right to wrest the question of Palestine itself back from what it had been reduced to, namely merely a tactical device in Israeli and hence by extension U.S. strategy. As many commentators have pointed out, the UN bid not only sidelined, but showed the political bankruptcy of the U.S. insofar as it has pledged itself to the unending and unquestioning support of Israel, even at the expense of its own vital national interests in the, in the Middle East. The more the Palestinian leadership insisted on its right to seek global recognition of Palestinian statehood along the very lines articulated so recently, within a year, by President Obama himself, the more cornered the U.S. seemed to become. The more the U.S. refused to countenance recognizing the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people, the more it shrank to irrelevance in the eyes of 360 million Arabs, who are today among the, mo the world's most politically mobilized peoples. The more President Obama, with his eye on the 2012 elections here, pledged his support for and encouragement of Israel, the more isolated America seemed to become to the rest of the world an isolation illustrated so poignantly by the fact that the only person sharing the sullen silence of the Israeli ambassador in the UN during the otherwise unanimous standing ovation offered to Mr. Abbas by the world community was the equally sullen and stone-faced uh, American ambassador to the UN. <laughs> so far, so good. But it would be a mistake, of course, to praise the Palestinian bid at the UN without also recognizing and taking into account its flaws and pitfalls however disguised they may have been by the emotional and imaginative register successfully addressed in Mr. Abbas's speech. The point I want to make here is quite simple. The UN bid and the speech itself and its reception in the General Assembly and around the world revealed the vast potential, but I want to be precise as a scholar and say, use the accurate word, the vast power of the Palestinian narrative and cause. It also revealed the extreme reluctance or inability of Mr. Abbas and his associates to actually take full advantage of that power and use it to its fullest extent. Let's put it this way. Mr. Abbas was channeling, he was deploying, he was holding in his hands almost literally, a form of power that he simultaneously seemed to be unwilling or unprepared to actually use, as though he felt surprised or uncomfortable or embarrassed to discover that he actually has any autonomous power of his own as derived from his people's actual cause, rather than as being assigned to him by Israeli or American dictates from above. For alongside Mr. Abbas's depiction of Israel as a criminal state manifestly engaged in the internationally prohibited crimes of colonialism, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing, there was a recurring insistence in the speech, not on calling Israel to account and holding it responsible for the criminal activities that he's amply enumerating, which would be the logical culmination of where you're going in that kind of argument. But on the contrary, a hapless, downplaying, almost pleading insistence that he does not seek to isolate Israel or to question its legitimacy, as though he ought to feel sorry or apologize for delineating the crimes committed against his people rather than pressing them home. Similarly, buried within the fine and stirring outlines of the Palestinian narrative in the speech, there was a series of positive references also to the same tired old peace process and its empty vocabulary of vacuous gestural proceedings, Oslo and the roadmap and the quartet and final status negotiations, blah, 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 uh, whose demise the speech itself was all suppo supposed to mark. Dig a little beneath the surface, in other words, and you'll find an event riven with contradictions, running alternately backwards and forwards, hot and cold, forthright and defensive. And as with the speech, so with the letter of application to the Secretary General of the UN itself. On the one hand, Abbas's letter of application for recognition of statehood claims to base itself on UN General Assembly 181, uh, Resolution 181 of 1947, <coughs> the partition plan, of course, and General Assembly Resolution 194 of 1948, which, in addition to more famously seeking to recognize the right of return and compensation of Palestinians expelled during the ethnic cleansing of 1948, also demanded access to 
and international administration of holy places throughout historic Palestine. On the other hand, the letter also based its claim in references to Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, which address only those parts of Palestine occupied in 1967. Just on this one point, there's a huge difference. Insofar as Israel has international legitimacy and recognition, it is actually in terms of resolutions 181 and 194, on the basis of which explicitly it was admitted to UN membership, with roughly half of historical Palestine. And we should recall, of course, that Israel has never formally declared its borders and asked other states to recognize them. So if the Palestinian letter wants to refer to resolution 181, why does it not do so fully? and claim at least the other half of Palestine is the territory of the state it's seeking to have recognized, an argument for which there is a very sound basis in international law. Why limit itself to the territories occupied in 1967, which amount to just over a fifth of, the, of historic Palestine? If the letter wants to refer to Resolution 194, why does it not follow through with a reminder that that document also resolved to place the holy places including Nazareth, now inside Israel, under international administration so that access to holy sites would be protected? Why does it not point out Israel's sweeping failure to fulfill the demands of Resolution 194, again on the basis of which it was admitted to membership in the UN, by refusing to allow the return of refugees, by refusing to protect religious sites, not just in the territories occupied in 67, but throughout historic Palestine, where from Akka to Yaffa, from Bir Sabah to Jerusalem, it has turned mosques into discotheques, shrines into barns, and ancient cemeteries into parks and sites for museums, most famous the, the absurd Museum of Tolerance, so-called, in Jerusalem, <laughs> on the oldest Muslim cemetery in the city. Why does it not reiterate the fact that Resolution 194 explicitly says that the whole of Jerusalem, the whole area of Jerusalem, from Shafat in the north to, to Abu Dis in the east to Bethlehem in the south, should not be under Israeli control? There are other contradictions as well. In invoking Resolution 194, the, the, the letter of application invokes the single most important Palestinian uh, claim, namely the right of return of those expelled during 1948 and their right to be compensated for their losses as well. On the other hand, the letter also claims the authority of the Oslo Agreements, the roadmap, the pronouncements of the Quartet, all of which disastrously depleted and diluted the full rights and, cl and claims of the Palestinian people. Why then, in aiming to move beyond the roadblock represented by the architecture of the so-called peace process, does the letter of application still circle around to reinvoke all over again the very thing it's trying to get around? What does it mean to appeal, on the one hand, to the full spectrum of Palestinian rights, already historically recognized by the UN, and, on the other hand, to the pale shadow of those rights as embodied in the key documents of the so-called peace process? Which is it, hot or cold, new or old, assertive or apologetic, passive or aggressive? All of these contradictions, and there are many more than the ones that I just touched on, suggest that Mr. Abbas's speech his letter of application for UN membership, and indeed the whole political theater at the UN, is just that, political theater, and not really intended to address or secure the rights of all Palestinians, but rather to reassert the failing political fortunes of Mr. Abbas himself, and to tactically reframe, rather than strategically re transforming, the pointless negotiations game that he and his associates have been embarked on for two decades now, with little to show in return for their efforts, other than an almost tripling of the number of Jewish colonists settling ever more deeply into the occupied territories, and of course the simultaneous deeper immobilization and immiseration of the Palestinian people. Moreover, as people have pointed out, the statehood gambit at the UN carries enormous political risk for the entire Palestinian people that Mr. Abbas and his associates have entered into without even consulting them. As many legal scholars, including Guy Goodwin Gill and, a, and more recently a team of Palestinian legal scholars whose declaration was circulated by the Ma'an News Service recently, he pointed out there is a pointed danger that if the place of the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, of the entire Palestinian people, is taken at the UN by a putative Palestinian state representing only that minority of Palestinians who actually live in the occupied territories, the majority of Palestinians might find themselves excluded from the representation at the world body for which they struggled so valiantly in the 1960s and 70s. There's also the attendant danger that if Palestinian rights are rewritten in the UN 
system on the basis of, of the much narrower set of claims concerning statehood in the territories of 1967, the exercise of the right of return of the refugees and their descendants, as well as the civil and political and indeed human rights of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, might be placed in jeopardy. Is it really necessary to ask whether Mr. Abbas and his associates are prepared to accept the sacrifice of the rights of the majority of Palestinians in return for being given, so to speak, a state in parts of the West Bank? If there were any lingering doubts around that question, surely they should have been put to rest by the so-called Palestine Papers leaked to Al Jazeera and The Guardian earlier this year, which documented in minute and painful detail the exact extent to which Abbas and the disgraced Saib Arakat, who seems to have come back, by the way, were willing to go on in pursuing their quest for illusory statehood. This is not to mention that even as Mr. Abbas was, pre was presenting his stirring speech at the UN, his Israel-armed and American-trained security forces were busily cracking down on any sign of dissent in the towns and refugee camps of the West Bank, just as it should be pointed out, of course, Hamas forces were cracking down on celebrations of the event in Gaza. Security cooperation with the Palestinians is excellent at the moment, and we do not want to jeopardize that, a senior Israeli military official told the British newspaper The Independent just the other day, which alone should lift any doubts about the extent to which the Palestine Authority, or PA, has become what it was always intended to be, a full-blown collaborationist apparatus whose main function is to facilitate the occupation and colonization of the West Bank, not to challenge it or end it. I raise these by now familiar criticisms in order to make the point that Mr. Abbas and his associates seem not to have noticed the resurgence of popular democratic activism in the intifadas, called intifadas, sweeping across the Arab world from the Maghrib to the Mashrib. For all the claims to transparency and accountability and institutional development claimed by the PA, they published this very shiny booklet that you may have seen that's going around that says, we're all clean and shiny and World Bank certified and all this other stuff. For all that, in actual fact, it remains a profoundly undemocratic institution. Earlier suggestions of the PA's financial corruption have been mitigated to a certain extent and replaced by the much more serious charge of its out-and-out -out collaboration with Israeli occupation. The unelected, and I emphasize that in the context of the Arab Spring, the unelected leadership in Ramallah, which, having been swept from office by elections in 2006, was brought back to office almost literally on the turret of an Israeli tank, remains completely uninterested in any accounting for the scandal of the Palestine Papers, or anything else for that matter. Mr. Abbas and his associates have made zero effort to reach out to and explain to their people in any detail their vision and strategy, much less to actually try to secure popular legitimacy for the high-stakes poker game they're playing at the UN, in which all Palestinians not merely an unrepresentative and unelected clique of middle-aged men have a stake. As they've done since entering into this series of negotiations at Oslo in 1993, they keep only their own councils and make no effort to engage the prominent and global body of Palestinian expertise in water rights, geography, international law, negotiation strategy, refugee rights, demographics, and so forth. Above all, they cling to the empty carapace of precisely the same hopeless program and the same meaningless jargon of final status negotiations, a phrase that you can tell I, I in, dislike intensely, and road maps and quartets or sextets or whatever it is, and the same failed two-state strategy to which they've been committed for two decades, with, as I said before, nothing to show for all their effort. In the age of the Arab Spring, these guys look like the left behind and even, if that's possible, lesser versions of Ali Abdullah Saleh and Husni Mubarak and Zainal Abidin Ben Ali. Let me put it this way. The idea that the rights of some Palestinians can be addressed in a two-state solution that ignores or actually undermines the rights of the majority of Palestinians is doomed to failure. It should never have been embarked upon in the first place. The mere fact that the loudest champions of the creation of a Palestinian state in parts of the West Bank are Israelis, running the gamut from soft-core liberal Zionists to seasoned and canny politicians like Ehud Olmert or Tzipi Livni should be the clearest warning necessary that there's something profoundly flawed with this idea from a Palestinian perspective. The Palestinian Declaration of Independence, wrote Sefi Rachlevsky in the Israeli paper Yediot Aranot the other day, uh, the Palestinian Declaration of Independence practically constitutes, I'm quoting here, a victory for Israel's Declaration of Independence. And this is why Israelis must celebrate in the streets and be the first to recognize Palestinian independence, calling on the world to follow suit.
The point being made there is that if Palestinians officially declare that what they seek is only a state in the West Bank and nothing else, that relieves Israel of the challenge of democratic and equal rights for all citizens, including returned refugees, which constitutes, of course, the nightmare facing the Israelis. Let us be absolutely clear about this. Palestinians living inside Israel today face a mounting set of ideological, legal, religious, political, and material forms of repression, unlike anything they've ever faced in their past, including when they lived under martial law for two decades. A new wave of explicitly racist laws targets them as a reviled non-Jewish minority and strips them of their right to land, to family unification, to education, to housing, and even to historical memory. There's a law that bans you from commemorating the Nakba of 1948. Nowhere is the repression of Israel's Palestinians more starkly evident than in the Nakab Desert in the south, where Palestinian Bedouin have been subjected recently to a form of relentless victimization that, seek, that seems to recapitulate again and again, week after week, almost day after day, the experience of the Nakba. In fact, to remind us that the Nakba began but th did not end in 1948. Every single structure in the village of Anaqib, for example, in the Negev, has been demolished by Israeli bulldozers, not once or twice or three times or ten times, but 20 times in the past year alone. 20 times they demolished an entire village and the people rebuilt it again. 20 times in one year. Just last month, the Israeli government proposed new plans to transfer, yes, that word, transfer, 30,000 Palestinian Bedouin in the Naqab from their ancestral lands to new concentration points, as the Israelis call them, in order to safeguard the nakedly racist Zionist vision of a Negev free of Arabs. What would a Palestinian state in the West Bank do for the residents of Araqib and the other one and a half million Palestinians living inside Israel, other than condemn them all the more to their status as reviled and degraded non-Jews cluttering up the space of a supposedly Jewish state. Meanwhile, the Palestinian refugees, the single largest component of the Palestinian people, continue to languish in the exile to which they've been condemned for over six decades, living not only in disgraceful circumstances in refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, but also ever more subject to the political violence sweeping across the Arab world, as we were reminded by the total obliteration total obliteration of the Nahr al-Barid refugee camp in North Lebanon a couple of years ago, or the more recent bombardment of Palestinian refugee camps in Syria. What would a state in the West Bank do for the residents of Sabra or Shatila or Nahr al-Barid, other than confirm their condemnation to a fate of being left to their own devices as a permanent form of human flotsam and jetsam, the detritus of a catastrophe whose making we are to believe can be taken off the table of history? How are we to forget the catastrophe of 1948 and all that it represents in human terms today? Here we are clearly on the familiar terrain of the argument between the dwindling number, I think, of Palestinians still espousing a two-state solution and the growing number of Palestinians advocating a one-state solution, an issue I don't want to dwell on at great length because I have in numerous other contexts documented my own position on that debate, which is that the Palestinians are one people who share one cause, and the only path to a just peace is to address the rights of all Palestinians, not just the minority who've suffered under occupation since 1967. I do, however, have one or two things I want to add about this debate in view of the uprising sweeping across the Arab world, and also the UN statehood bid. And I want to do so by pointing out something I couldn't help noticing in the text of the letter uh, for UN applying for UN membership for Palestine to the UN. For there are actually two contradictory lines to the signature in the letter. I don't know if you've seen the official letter. It's interesting. One identifying Mr. Abbas as the president of the state of Palestine, and the other identifying him as the chairman of the PLO. The question this contradiction raised in my mind, and this could be because I'm a literary kind of guy and this is the kind of thing that interests me you know, in my scholarship, uh, is, is not the one about whether uh, Mr. Abbas really can, be, can claim to be the president of the state of Palestine because the state doesn't really actually exist. And anyway, he wasn't elected to be the president of Palestine. And his term as the president of the PA expired almost three years ago now. I don't want to talk about that. What I've been wondering about, I mean, I could if you want me to, but you know the story. What I've been wondering about in looking at the signature is the relationship between the Palestine, literally the word, 
referred to in the line State of Palestine and the Palestine referred to in the line Palestine Liberation Organization. Is the Palestine that the Palestine Liberation Organization aims to liberate the same Palestine as the Palestine whose independence and statehood Mr. Abbas is asserting? If not, what happened and what happens to that other, wider and more inclusive vision of Palestine? Are we really to accept that the newly redefined Palestine light or Palestine 2.0 should take the place of the original Palestine? Can we accept that the West Bank can become Palestine in the way that my arm or leg might become me in some strange sense? Or is there something still vitally important about the Palestinian insistence that Palestine, the original and only Palestine, is their ancestral homeland in which they demand the realization of their inalienable rights as a people, those who are presently refugees, who have the right to return to homes and land from which they were expelled in 1948, those who are the survivors of 1948 and now living in Haifa and Akka and Nasra and Shefa Amr and Yafa and Al Araqib, who have the right to live as free and equal citizens in their own land, and who suffering under and those suffering under occupation in Khan Yunus and Beit Laham and Al Kharir and Nasri and so forth and the Nablus and so forth, who have the same right. It is true that the one state solution, which I personally advocate, is not is not the only way to address and guarantee the rights of all Palestinians. In principle, there could be a two-state solution that also guaranteed the right of the return of refugees, including the refugees of Gaza, by the way, to their homes inside what is today Israel, and guaranteed the rights of present-day Palestinian citizens of Israel. But that is not the two-state solution that we are now or have ever been talking about, because the Israelis have made it abundantly clear that they will never accept a state in which Jews would be outnumbered by non-Jews. Now, it's precisely on this point, about what the Israelis say they will or won't accept, that a few words are in order about the terms that we often hear about in these kinds of discussions, realism, pragmatism, expectations, a set of terms that often comes up in one state, two state debate. The worst habit, it seems to me, of those advocating a two state solution is that they never stop congratulating themselves on how pragmatic and realistic they are as opposed to those supposedly dreamy and unrealistic, if not downright romantic, one-staters. One reason they congratulate themselves in this way is that they say a two-state solution is more realistic because the Israelis will never accept a one-state solution, and therefore they say we have to be pragmatic and accept this as a fact. But as I just said, the Israelis are no more willing to accept a just two-state solution that recognizes and embraces the rights of return and of equal rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel then they are willing to accept a one-state solution that treats all citizens as equals. What then is a partial two-state solution worth if it leaves the majority of Palestinians high and dry? Is it really realistic and pragmatic to accept Palestinians to determine their rights and articulate their aspirations on the basis of what Israelis deem to be acceptable? Is it really realistic to say that what the Palestinians can achieve depends on what Israelis are willing to have them address? I think not. Those who claim to be so realistic and pragmatic seem not to have ever had a passing knowledge with documented empirical reality of historical experience, which teaches us over and over again that no privileged group in the history of the world has ever voluntarily renounced its privileges. Not King Charles I of England, who was executed by his people in 1649. Not the British aristocracy in the 19th century, who faced a popular challenge to transform an aristocratic country into a democratic one. Not the slave-owning classes of the American South. Not the white elites of the U.S. in the civil rights era of the 1960s. And not the, and not the white beneficiaries of apartheid in South Africa in the 1970s and 80s. History, and by this I mean real, hard history, teaches us that privileged groups relinquish their privileges only when they have no other choice, and that, historically speaking, such abandonments of privilege have been brought about non-violently at least as often as they have been brought about violently. If we want to be realistic and pragmatic and look to history for our examples, we have to begin by realizing that the Israelis will never countenance a relinquishing of their privileges until they are compelled to do so preferably, as far as I'm concerned, by nonviolent means. And it is at least as realistic to seek to compel them to accept the parameters of a single democratic and secular state, a state that guarantees the rights of all minorities, as it is to compel the, to accept them, them to accept a cobbled-together state 
of two, sorry, two-state solution that properly addresses Palestinian rights by having an Israel with a Jewish minority, which of course totally obviates the need to have two separate states to begin with. So much for the realism of our expectations. A couple of more points are in order before I wrap up what I want to say today. And I want to here talk about the other claims to realism made by the advocates of a partial two-state solution. Citing resolutions 242 and 338, they continually repeat the claim that their vision is more realistic than the one-state vision because it has a basis in international law and in an international consensus. This again is facile, it seems to me, because there's an equally strong basis in international law for the one-state solution, namely, for example, Resolution 194, and the wide range of international legal covenants prohibiting the forms of racial discrimination and apartheid on which the very notion of an exclusively Jewish state depends for its existence, at least insofar as it's created in a historically not exclusively Jewish land. As for this international consensus about which we hear so often, it would be folly for the advocates of Palestinian rights to forget that this so-called consensus was not something that the family of nations agreed to and presented to the Palestinians. It is something that the Palestinians themselves maintained an earnest and dedicated struggle, not merely to put it on, but to force it on the world's agenda in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Have people seriously forgotten the moment a mere 20 years ago when the very idea of a Palestinian state and the two-state solution seemed laughable? Do people really think that a Palestinian state, as recognized for all its flaws, by an overwhelming majority of the countries and populations of the world was simply dropped out of the sky by a passing alien skyship? The very talk of a Palestinian state is something happening today that the Palestinian people made happen against the established global powers of their time in the face of entrenched Israeli and American opposition and the indifference of the Europeans through their sheer determination, their sheer sacrifice and force of will. The only thing stopping the Palestinians from demanding the full spectrum of their rights are the Palestinians themselves, or rather, the completely outmoded and worn-out leadership in both Ramallah and Gaza, whose political projects have now, I think we can safely say, run their course. Let me clarify what I'm trying to say here by going back to the standing ovation that Mr. Abbas received at the United Nations. On that day, the representatives of the vast majority of the human race stood and celebrated for the people of Palestine and the Palestinian cause in a way that it is almost unimaginable for almost any other people or cause. What do you call, I want to ask, what do you call the ability without any other inducement, there's no army, there's no superpower, there's no money, there's no IMF, there's no nothing, what do you call the ability without any other inducement than an appeal to the imagination to move hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the entire world who have over and over again for six decades steadfastly demonstrated their support and solidarity with the Palestinian people and their cause. What do you call that capacity, that potential? In a word, you call it power. That's what it is, to move millions and millions of people. It's power. It's a form of power. My point here is really quite simple. The Palestinian people have far, far more power than they sometimes allow themselves to think or to believe certainly and demonstrably far more power than Mr. Abbas felt comfortable wielding at the UN, as I was trying to suggest earlier. However, the Palestinians' power does not function, in fact, it's totally disabled, it becomes a liability even, at the polite diplomatic negotiating table or on the battlefield. Switch the terrain, however, from the negotiating table between totally unequal parties backed by, we all know, an even more unequal party, the US, and the battlefield uh, from, sorry, from the negotiating table on the battlefield to the realm of ideas and of the imagination and ask yourselves in all seriousness who has the upper hand there in that realm, in that domain, on that plane of existence. The Israelis, who are engaged in a hopeless defense of a brittle, racist, ethno-religious colonial state project that is like a fish out of water in the 21st century? Or the Palestinians, who have over and over again demonstrated their ability to instantly reach out and touch the hearts and minds and imaginations of a global audience of hundreds of millions of people. From the first intifada of the 1980s to the current nonviolent protests along the apartheid wall in the West Bank, a struggle that engages and activates a global imaginary realm from Hollywood films to the work of the London street artist Banksy, the Palestinians have repeatedly made clear that at the level of symbols in the imagination, the Israelis, for all their vast and paid armies of Hasbara agents, web crawlers, 
Wikipedia writers, they have an army of people rewriting Wikipedia all the time. Facebook propagandists, people who tweet and stuff like that. The agitators on campus, etc. They can't touch the Palestinians at this level, at the level of the imaginary and the symbolic. When is the last time, think about it, that an Israeli won a public debate against the Palestinians? Have you ever seen it happen? In my life, I don't think I've ever seen it happen, personally. My point here is that it's not just pointless, but altogether a doomed strategy for Palestinians to try to achieve their rights in domains and registers, including state diplomacy, in which they hold no cards, in fact, in which the deck is stacked against them, when they could be operating at the level of the imaginary, where they completely outclass their opponents. Now, let me add just one or two more details before wrapping up. In shifting their struggle from the plane of state diplomacy to the plane of the symbolic and the imaginary, the Palestinians must make it absolutely clear in the simplest and most straightforward and easily digestible form what it is that they demand. A strong message needs clarity, focus, precision. Here, the one-state solution is far, far more readily transmissible and understandable than any other formulation of what a just and lasting peace would look like from a Palestinian perspective, indeed from an Israeli perspective, I should add. It simply and neatly encapsulates form, outlines and expresses a vision of rights, rights for all Palestinians, and also embracing and encompassing the rights of all Jewish Israelis, that is not just unimpeachable, but irresistible. On that point, don't just take my word for it. In a talk I gave in this very room, I, I can't remember, three, four years ago, I quoted then Prime Minister Olmert, who was speaking in November 2003 and explaining his vision of the future and the possible alternatives towards uh, a peace settlement. And I'm quoting all merit here, not my favorite person in the entire world, as you can imagine. He says, there is no, and I'm quoting him, there is no doubt in my mind that very soon the government of Israel is going to have to address the demographic issue with the utmost seriousness and resolve. This issue above all others will dictate the solution that we must adopt. We don't have unlimited time. More and more Palestinians are uninterested in a negotiated two-state solution because they want to change the essence of the conflict from an Algerian paradigm, armed resistance to occupation, to a South African one. From a struggle against occupation in their parlance, that's Olmert speaking, to a struggle for one man, one vote. That is, of course, this is still Olmert, not me, although I agree. This is, of course, a much cleaner struggle, a much more popular struggle, and ultimately a much more powerful one. That's Ehud Olmert himself, hardly a sympathetic man when it comes to Palestinian rights. This is an argument that he reiterated in 2003, 2004, 2006, 2007. He said it over and over and over again. Of course, he's perfectly right. So my question is, what are the Palestinians waiting for? Why should they continue to play along in the self-mutilating role assigned to them by an Israeli narrative of domination? when they are positioned to throw that narrative into total disarray and turn it on its head and move to a position which even their opponents acknowledge it's impossible for them to resist. One last point. When I speak of the Palestinian struggle embarking in this new direction, I'm speaking not about a future condition, but a present one. The regular nonviolent protests involving also Israeli and international participation along the wall in the West Bank, for example, the global campaign for BDS, boycotts, divestments, and sanctions, modeled on the campaign that was successful in ending apartheid in South Africa. Other movements like that, but actually the BDS movement is very interesting, and my favorite example of the BDS movement remains the 2010 uh, Davis Cup tennis match in Sweden. You, do you know about that? When the, the, the match was supposed to be played in Stockholm, at the last minute, fearing protests, the Swedish authorities moved the match from Stockholm to, Oz to uh, Malmo. And so the Israeli and Swedish tennis players played tennis in a totally empty stadium, while outside there was still a huge protest. It's amazing to consider that spectacle, especially when you see it in photographic form. <laughs> Inside the stadium, outside the stadium. This is a protest that, by the way, they, they weren't even expecting because they moved, they moved it at the last minute. So these guys are playing tennis in a completely empty stadium. It looks as though one of them has you know, a communicable disease or something like that. <laughs> There are other movements as well, other than BDS. The Gaza Youth Breakout, for example, a new generation of Palestinian activists, fluent and comfortable speaking English to a global audience in a way that their parents <laughs> never were, savvy in new media and social media like Facebook and Twitter. The realm of music, there's hip-hop bands like them, cinema. Think of what a historic accomplishment it is for 
Hani Abu Asad to have won the Golden Globe for Paradise Now. I mean, the Golden Globe for a Palestinian film about suicide bombing, that's stunning if you think about it. Think about what that means, what that represents. These people are already leading the way and charting the future of the Palestinian struggle, taking it to the terrain of language, symbols, and the imagination where Palestinians are forced to be reckoned with. I'd like to conclude by taking us back to where I began today, that is, an explicit engagement with the role of the imagination of political struggle. I want to do so because I want to make it absolutely clear to any lingering realists in the room that appealing to the imagination and to hope itself is not merely, as it is often dismissed by realists, a dreamy and visionary gesture that does not translate into political capital, but on the contrary, that any political struggle forsakes a claim to the imagination and to hope at its peril. Let me put it somewhat differently. There can be no political transformation without hope. In fact, of all people, Barack Obama demonstrated that to us a couple of years ago. <laughs> hope, in other words, is not something that exists in the future. Hope is something that makes the future happen. To clarify this point, I want to shift finally away. I know I've said finally many times. This is, really is the finally. <laughs> fine. I want to shift away from an immediate focus on Palestine to, to, a, to a domain that is quite different, but nevertheless, I think, very relevant. A domain in, in which, incidentally, Edward Said found both solace and inspiration, namely the literary. I could proceed here by talking about the role of literature in the Palestinian struggle, the significance of musicians or poets from Mahmoud Darwish to Tamim Barghouti, but instead I want to underline what I think is the broader significance of this point by invoking the field of study which Edward completely revolutionized, namely English literature, which may be an odd thing to talk about in the Palestine Center. Maybe it's the first time it's come up here, I don't know. The two examples I have in mind very, very quickly are the two great English poets in whom I'm personally also interested, Blake and Shelley. Blake, first of all, who wrote in the last year of his life that the history of all times and places is nothing else but improbabilities and impossibilities. What we should say was impossible if we did not see it always before our eyes. It's an astonishing line because what it gets at, what it captures is precisely that sense that we have to always hang on to what we are always told is impossible in a dream because it's always happening anyway. You can never relinquish the impossible. You should always hang on to the potential of the impossible. That's one of Blake's, I think, great messages. And finally, I want to end with a, a short, very short poem, a sonnet, in fact, 14 lines, by the great English poet Percy Shelley. Uh, it's a poem that he wrote in 1819. In fact, it's called England in 1819. And I want to say one or two things very, very quickly, a few seconds, by way of context. He wrote this, Shelley was a famous advocate of democratic rights for the people of England. Remember, England in the 19th century was not a democratic country. It was a very, very repressive aristocratic regime. Most people had no rights. 2%, 3% of the people had the right to vote. So there was a large democratic struggle for the people's rights, which took, it took 200 years to accomplish. But Shelley was an ardent proponent of these rights. He wrote the poem I'm about to show you and talk about in the darkest moment, the single darkest moment of that entire struggle for democracy in England, the single darkest moment, after a, a group of demonstrators in the city of Manchester was massacred by basically the constabulary. So they were peaceful, peacefully protesting, demanding the right to vote and annual parliaments and universal suffrage and this kind of thing, and the police force massacred them. It was called the Peterloo Massacre in 1819. In the darkest moment of the struggle, Percy Shelley wrote the poem that I want to talk about. And I'll read it to you. Of course, it's referring to the King of England, George III, who was then dying, about to be replaced by the Prince Regent, or George IV. Uh, let, let, me, let me read it to you. Oh, the, sorry, the lines here are messed up because of the formatting. I'm sorry. It's, it's a 14-line sonnet. An old, mad, blind, despised, and dying king, princes, the dregs of their dull race, who flow through public scorn, mud, from a muddy spring, rulers who neither see nor feel nor know, but leech-like cling to their fainting country, to their fainting country cling, till they drop, blind in blood without a blow. A people, starved and stabbed in the untilled field, an army, which liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield, golden and sanguine laws which tempt and slay. Religion Christless, godless, a book sealed, a senate, the parliament, time's worst statute unrepealed. All this terrible nightmare of 1819, the massacre of Peter and so forth. 
all of these terrible things, you finally get to the turn of the poem in the last two lines, are graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. And what you see in Shelley writing this, as I said, the darkest possible moment in English history, one of the darkest moments in English history, in the very darkness itself, is the vision of light and hope. Now Shelley, of course, is a great poet, and of course I'm a scholar of British Romanticism, so it's not a coincidence that I like Shelley, but his role wasn't just as a poet read by professors of English literature. He was also always read by the people engaged in democratic protest. There were illegal pirated copies of Shelley's poetry circulating among people demonstrating and protesting. The people in Peterloo had copies of Shelley's poetry. He's somebody whose poetry animated and moved people to protest. The sh poetry of Shelley, including this poem, helped bring about the very hope that is articulating. It took two or three more decades, but finally the English people did accomplish, at least men. It took women another 60 years after that, but that's another story. But they did accomplish their rights through nonviolent protest, by the way, against all the forces of an established order, an armed monarchy that refused to countenance giving them rights, so on and so forth. And they did it because they had hope. So what I want to say to the Palestinians is hope is the key to political struggle. It's not something you should ever let go. Thank you. Uh, John Salzberg, Washington Interfaith Alliance for Middle East Peace. Uh, thank you for a very moving talk. And given your criticism of the PA and President Abbas, would you advise Palestinians uh, in, uh, in the territories to uh, seek, as in the case of uh, Egypt and Tunisia, to seek a change in, in the regime, a d more democratic regime? I, I, I think that's something that they're, that they're already engaged in doing. It doesn't t I, they don't need me to tell them that. They're already, I think people are already working on that. And it's not just Palestinians in the occupied territories, there's Palestinians around the world who are busy doing this. If we remember, for example, the frequent, the more frequent, actually, the demonstrations commemorating the Nakba inside Israel, by Palestinians inside Israel, those are becoming much more visible than they used to be, and put down with immense force by the Israeli state, because it's, you can't do that kind of thing inside Israel, almost legally at this point. So those forms of protests are taking place, and I, you know, I, who can say what's going to happen in the coming months or years, but I would expect that just as the Arab revolutions across the Arab, the revolutions sweeping the Arab world are called intifadas, it's not only a reference to Palestine, but it is also a reference to Palestine, I think, the Palestinians themselves will remember the, the, their own intifada, the first one, and what it represented and how it threw their own putative leadership as well as the Israelis and everybody else into disarray because the people suddenly were speaking in a way that they hadn't been in the same sense before. So I, I would hope so. Thank you, Professor McDesey, for a very moving experience for all of us. My name is Tom Getman. I'm a former Hill staffer and NGO executive in Jerusalem. What do you say to the people who are realists but long for your vision um, that a two-state solution is a step toward the desired long for one-state solution? That's, that's a very good question, and it, it is one that, that obviously often comes up in the context of two-state. My, my own sense is that, is that if we just imagine, for, just for the purposes of arguments, and that's what this is, if we imagine a state suddenly being created in, the West, in all of the West Bank, I mean, let's, let's indulge ourselves and say really, really all the West Bank, not this with mutually agreed swaps and all that stuff. And this. So let's say there's a real state in the West Bank. Uh, my question is, let's say... The, 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 state of the, the seat of the UN is taken by that state, since that's what the state of Palestine would become, would be recognized as. What happens to the refugees and to the Palestinians inside Israel? So my worry is, then the focus will suddenly, m much of the world will think, oh, well, the question of Palestine is now resolved. There's a state. It's over. And the millions of refugees will be left saying, well, wh wh what about us? Where do, where do we, what happens to us? What about our rights? And of course, the ones inside Israel in the context of any of the two-state solutions being talked about, are in an even worse position because the Israelis are becoming more and more adamant that the other state would be a Jewish state, right, and have to be recognized as such. And, and 
So that leaves the Palestinian minority 20% and growing of the population of Israel, inside Israel, in, it, totally abandoned. So my worry is that it, it actually, I don't think that the, that the full version of that would ever happen. I don't think, they, I don't think, it's, impo I don't think it's possible to imagine Israel removing 500,000 settlers who are, in the, who are in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, dismantling all those facilities, giving up the Jordan Valley, giving up the airspace. And the, I just, I, you know, I mean, the realists are always saying you have to be realistic. I don't think it's realistic to imagine that even for a second. But even if you do, I still don't think it can work. But if it doesn't, it won't even address the rights of Palestinians in the West Bank, let alone Gaza. Who knows about East Jerusalem, which is and a whole other can of worms, right? So, and it certainly won't address the rights of the majority of Palestinians. And it could just well be a diversionary thing. So it seems to me that one of the great merits of the one-state solution is it says, look, look at the actual circumstances. You don't have to go imagine this and imagine that, think about this and what about this and what about that. Look, look objectively at the map. There is one state. There aren't six states. There's one state that controls all of historic Palestine right now. And it's m nakedly and obviously and patently and clearly an apartheid state. Inside Israel, the Palestinian minority is systematically denied rights that are granted to, not just, by the way, to Israeli Jews, but to any Jews anywhere. And, of course, in the West Bank and Gaza, it's even worse. In Gaza, worse than the West Bank, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems clear that the Palestinians can just tell the world, look, is this acceptable in the 21st century that there's an ethno-religious ethno state denying the rights of the majority of the land's population? I say the majority because, of course, the refugees are also blocked. It's part of the, whole, the same setup. So I, to my mind, if the Palestinians say in one voice, we find this completely unacceptable. Do you, the world, find it acceptable? This is the way a country should look in the 21st century? I can't imagine for a second that, that, that the world would accept it. And, and even if the world let it go for a bit longer, to, merely in terms of negotiating uh, tactics, to put the Israelis on the back foot and have them defend naked injustice, naked racism, let them defend it. Let them articulate why it's so important to, for there to be a, an exclusively Jewish state in a land that has never in history been exclusively Jewish. It's always been all kinds of things. That's the Palestine has always been. Read the Bible. There's always, there are always people that there weren't Jewish. It's all kinds of people. So put them on the, on the back foot. You know, turn the tables. That's what, I mean, it seems to, I'm not a political theorist. I'm an English professor. But that's, it seems to me, what, what people should do. Well, I'm Nadir Ashal Hubkevorkian. Haifa or Ot, the old city of Jerusalem. I'm a professor of law at the Hebrew University and from Madal Carmel Haifa. My question is first, I really enjoyed your talk. I think that your sense of hope is amazing. Yeah, your, um, the, the hope in your voice was, uh, was amazing and it gives lots of power. But my question is as such yes, it is a one state solution, but I think one state as we see it today with the fragmentation of the space, but I think that it's a little bit more than this. It's not a little bit. It's the surveillance over the Palestinian living and dead body. It's the mundane power of Israeli security theology. And it's this game of necropolitics. It's an economy of life and death, as I see it in my work, as I see it in the different laws that were legislated the past couple of years against us as Palestinians in in Israel, as I see it against us in the old city, in Jerusalem. In, and I wonder whether we need to look even more than this, because this necropolitical game left us in a situation whereby there's, and, and you're asking Palestinians to be more assertive or to speak in a different voice. And I'm wondering whether you could ask more in such a necropolitical situation. And what is your message to the international community, especially the moral, ethical issue? That's one, one uh, issue that really um, I'm kind of questioning what can we do more on this level in terms of asking for more help because people are really tired and I see it clearly in our work. I see the power inside Israel but I see less power among us in Jerusalem because of this mundane security theology surveillance and, and, and fragmentation not only of the, of the spaces but also of the families and so sure. on. And, and number two, uh, I would like you to reflect on the work of human rights activism inside Israel. You mentioned Al Araqib. So much money is given to so many organizations, and nothing is, is, is changing. And the, and the demolition of Al Araqib is over 20 right now. So the question is, 
what else, what are the languages that we could speak, that we could talk, that we could call for, and, and put this moral responsibility? Um, thank you. Those are, those are great questions. I think, uh, I mean, about the, the necropolitical question, that is the, the ability of the Israelis to map and survey and watch and all that stuff, I, I mean, several things need to be said. Again, historically speaking, I mean, it's true that they have a formidable array of weapons and satellites and planes and all the rest of drones and all this other stuff. But w we know, historically speaking, that, that people, unarmed people, can rise up against of an infinitely more powerful foe and still prevail through all kinds of means. My point is that a confrontation at, at a military level is unthinkable for the Palestinians because of what you're saying. But Palestinians ha are in a unique ability precisely because of their dispersion to be able to actually outflank and outreach the Israelis in that sense. I mean, drones and, and, and surveillance and you know, robots killing people and all that, th that doesn't stop the BDS movement, for example. So there are ways to outflank that kind of opponent and to engage in a war at the symbolic level, the imaginary level, which I think ultimately has historically proven to be extremely effective in bringing about transformation. South Africa was a very similar case. This, I mean, if you go to South Africa and you see the kinds of violence inflicted by the white state on the native majority, it's unbelievable what they face. Okay, they didn't have helicopter gunships bombing Soweto and so forth, but they used a lot of force. They killed people, they had sent in armored cars and crushed people and took people away and killed, you know, all that. And yet still the, the people won, even, even though they, did, they weren't equipped to do so at a, in a physical sense, I mean in a military sense. Um, the second question has to do with, with the, the urgency to appeal to an international audience on these, precisely these kinds of questions. Uh, and I think that's where the BDS strategy is incredibly important. And I, I, really, I really honestly do think that, that this is a terrain in which the Israelis are on the back foot and the Palestinians have the advantage. Like I said, I think they have much more of, of an advantage than they often realize. And it's one that, although it's true, different components of the Palestinian people... Well, first of all, I want to say, historically, the center of gravity of the struggle has shifted from inside to outside to inside. It goes back and forth. Secondly, it's true, different segments are... Some are more exhausted than others because of the day-to-day -day life of occupation. We all know, or we ought to know, just living, just e merely ex breathing under occupation is, is takes time and effort and energy, and just let alone protesting and all that. So there's no question that people are tired. But I think that there's protests can be imagined in different communities, shifting from place to place. And then again, <coughs> within the occupied territories, to inside Israel, to Jerusalem, to the, to the refugee camps, to protesters in international cities like Washington or Chicago or whatever. So I think there's a way of moving that, that the Palestinians have available to them that I, I, I just think is... Yeah, not just uh, I don't just think in a sort of theoretical way, but I think it has already proven to be incredibly effective, and that's what I think uh, people should cling to. And then as for the funding of NGOs inside Israel, I, mean, I think tremendous human rights work is being done by both Israeli and Palestinian human rights NGOs inside Israel, including Adela, obviously. But um, I, don't, I can't speak to the issue of funding. I don't know enough about that. But uh, there's always more to be done, and there's little, little accomplished so far. And, I mean, they haven't been able to change much yet. But, and this is the last thing I want to say on this point, when historical transformation comes, it, of, it often comes, in fact, it usually comes very, very, very quickly. So if you went to South Africa, and, I don't know, in the mid-1980s and said, in a few years, Nelson Mandela will be free and be president of the republic, people would have said, you're dreaming. And then, you know, next thing you know, boom, 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 suddenly, lo and behold, Nelson Mandela is the president of South Africa and there's no more apartheid. Same thing with the fall of the Soviet Union, same thing with the ending of slavery, same thing with civil rights. I mean, these things always happen very quickly, suddenly. That's part of what Blake is getting at about that thing about the impossible. It's suddenly it happens. Who, who knew where it was going to come from? But it, it can happen. So I'm not worried about that in that sense. Transformation always happens. And, and, and it's, we're often, I think the Israelis often try to grind it into our heads, and the U.S. too, that you have to accept, you have no choice, you have to be realistic and compromise and, and do all this other stuff. And, and I, just, I just refuse that, not on principle, but on the, with the basis of historical hindsight and all those other kinds of contexts that have taught us so much about how to frame our own struggle. We've got a question that comes to us uh, from Twitter. Uh, and the question is, should Abbas retract the statehood bid? What would be the consequences and the alternatives? I, I think it's, I, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's a bit like they've, you know, they were declaring independence again when they'd already declared independence 
well, you know, you can't keep doing these things and then undoing them and redoing them. I think they've got to, at this point, they've done it. They have to stick with it. But what I think, I think they could rephrase it. I think they should connect it to a struggle. And of course, part of this is it's kind of an impossible question in the sense that, in the sense that Abbas shouldn't have been in the situation to begin with. I mean, who told him to go to the UN? Uh, he didn't ask me. He didn't ask you. He didn't ask anybody. As far as he asked his own people, but he didn't ask anybody else. So, in a way, it's kind of his problem to deal with. Of course, it's not really. It's also our problem. It's become our problem in that sense. But I, I think it's important for for this move of the UN to be linked to a broader Palestinian struggle, to be explicitly connected to it, to be embraced by people. And, and I think it, to a certain extent, I mean, even I, I have mixed feelings about it, as you can tell. I'm also seeing what... Th- th- there are positive things in it as well, which I think people should 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 acknowledge. But I, I mean, th- I think the important thing is to realize that um, the PLO itself is or should become a site of struggle. And I think the PLO, people have all, are talking about this all the time now, that the PLO itself needs to be retaken and democratized because it is, com- at this point, un- unaccountable to the Palestinian people and it should be accountable to the Palestinian people. I think that's one of the things Palestinians need to engage in. But so, yeah, I mean, there are a range of things that, that can be done linking to the UN bid, if not totally retracting it. Yeah, no, thanks very much for the uh for a very hopeful um, lecture. Um, I'm Ibrahim Rasul, ambassador of South Africa in the US, and I'm very grateful for the positive um, reflections between the situation in the Middle East and, and South Africa. I just want to say that next year in 2012, Africa's oldest liberation movement, the ANC, celebrates 100 years. It realized freedom after plus minus eight decades. And then only after 300 years of colonialism, slavery, and a range of other things that happened. So we're dealing with a fairly long trajectory. And the thing, as you say, that underpins it all the time is the narrative and the discourse of hope and, and so forth. But it's also based on very strong moral strength. It's the ability to make what you see as the end consistent with what you employ as your means. And I think that one needs to be able, if one is going to prosecute a struggle that really comes out to that, how do we discipline ways and means within the Palestinian struggle? How do we build a unity of purpose that's around a few simple demands and a simple vision um, of the future? So I think that that's that's the first part of what I I need to, to deal with. I think, secondly, we mustn't underestimate the competition of two imaginaries or two imaginations. And you have to step outside the liberated air of South Africa to come into the USA to see that there is a completely different moral universe with a different narrative of the Middle East. And so, for example, you're dealing with a hope-driven one um, that constitutes the Palestinian vision of where it can be, and it's it's muddied by all kinds of infighting and a range of other things. But you've got the counter um, imaginary, which is the imaginary of a perpetual historical victim, most recently of the Holocaust, the impending victimhood that will come from a mad um, Islamic fundamentalism and its attendant Islamophobia that did 911 and so forth, and the small state. Now, I think that by not being able to balance out the two imaginaries, you leave us a little bit up a creek without a paddle, because all you do is that you decry the realism that is the product, I think, of the post-89 world we're living in. And I think that possibly, and, and I'll end up here, that possibly we need to understand whether the moment we were at in 1989 with a single superpower emerging from the Cold War of which South Africa was partly a beneficiary and the big compromise of the two-state solution was also the product whether we are at a decisive moment in history now to rethink that. So we can decry the sellout, we can decry the corrupt, we can decry the fundamentalist but it doesn't take us forward if we don't locate it in a strategic moment now with the Arab uprisings, if we don't locate it within the lack of appetite and resources now of the West 
to fund those foreign adventures, is there a new stra strategic way forward that presents itself rather than underpin it only with the notion of hopefulness? Thank you very much, Coralie Farley, sociologist, activist. Uh, you've convinced me that we need a spin on the rationale for the U.S. opposition to the U.N. vote. And the spin would be, well, we're really opposed to it because what we really want is the one state, and that's why we're opposed to the, mm -hmm. how do we get there? That, that's, a, that's a good question, too. I mean, th these are all great questions. But let, me, let me try and take them in order. Uh, the one about South Africa first. I mean, I think, of course, there's always more to be said. And had, I, had you been confirmed here for three hours, I would have talked for three hours. But unfortunately, time is pressing, so I can't talk about everything. But your point is well taken about the strategic situation in particular. Um, let me say quickly two things in response. One is, of course, we're in a changed global conjunction. That's part of what the UN theater is about, which is the, the increasing, I don't want to say irrelevance of the US, obviously, but that would be overstating it. But certainly, I think it's fair to say the decline of the US and its claim to global supremacy, because it's, it literally can't afford it any longer. It's in hawk to other countries in terms of debt. So I mean, it's, it, the US is not what it used to be by any means. And insofar as the strategy formerly pursued in the Middle East depends on American supremacy, that, that also is, is coming up, is bursting at the seams of coming apart in some, in some way. In terms of the conjuncture of, of narratives, or if you want imaginaries or whatever, in the U.S. itself, yes, of course, there are other conflicting ones. And of course, I could talk about them. But of course, you also already know what they are. There's less interest in talking about them, I think. However, having said that, I think uh, two really important things in this subheading. One is, I think it's important for the for the Palestinians, I think it's vitally important, and again, South Africa is the precedent for this, for the Palestinians to finally embrace the rights of Jewish Israelis, which is part of what a united one-state solution would look like, something along the lines of the 1955-54 thing in South Africa, the, the Freedom Charter. Wasn't it 55? Yeah. I mean, w which, which explicitly has, which has a positive vision of what it would look like. That, of course, requires all the different Palestinian factions to come together. Part of retaking the PLO could involve deve that developing that kind of strategy. Part also could hinge on, people have uh, been saying for a couple of years now, come on, this two-state solution has got to be dead now. What more? It's over. Annapolis, it was said, and this is said, in the UN, it's been said. At some point, this thing really has got to run out of gas and stop. All right? And I think at that point, it'll be clear, well, that, is, that really is over. What's the alternative? And I think it'll be e relatively easy at that stage to to articulate a one state vision exactly along these lines to say this is what we stand for not just for our rights for your rights too for everybody's rights on universals that are easily recognizable and and universally understood and uh, appealing i think principles um in the last thing i want to say about this the 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 debate if you want the war of ideas in the u.s itself is that of course there's a preponderance of ideas in support of israel in the u.s now but and I say this as somebody who teaches at a university campus. Of course, I don't teach this. I teach English, which is a different thing. But um, I know from my knowledge of campuses what it takes to maintain, so far, the, 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 the I, I think, actually also gradually fading and falling apart Israeli narrative, if you want, which is massive, and I mean massive, institutional organization and funding. It takes them a huge amount of work just to stand still in this struggle. For us, it's not that difficult. We don't have, actually, we have no funding at all, as far as I know. And, and for example, I'm gonna, one quick example of this, the whole idea of the one-state solution, which has been put, as far as I can tell, on the world's agenda, one way or another, for or against, whatever. People are talking about it now, willy-nilly. Even 60 Minutes talks about it a couple of years ago, famously. It was put on the world's agenda, as far as I know, by a group of 10, 12, 13, 14 people, of whom I know, all of them, I think. And if you think what it means for 10 or 15 people to just by insisting on this point, writing op-eds and appearing on TV and making this point and giving speeches and so forth, to put this narrative on the world agenda against the PLO, against the PA, against the Israelis, against the US, against the UN, against the EU, against the quartet, just by sheer force of argument and ideas, it hasn't been accomplished, obviously, but you see what I'm saying. The, the balance of power is not quite what it always seems to be. The Israelis take, must, 
put a huge amount of institutional effort. For example, again, th the area I know best, university campuses. There are, I think, 30 to 35 individual organizations within the umbrella Israel on Campus Coalition. That's what it takes to monitor and police American college campuses to keep it to keep the Israeli narrative going. And even then, they're not they're they're falling behind very quickly. So, I think people in America are very open to to new ideas. I think the the gradual eclipsing of old media and the emergence of new media are transforming the way in which people think and think about ideas and and and. I think there's a lot of evidence to show that actually the American people aren't quite as amenable to the Israeli narrative as we are often led to believe they are. I also, by the way, don't think it's true that one can't check or at least test the premise of the need to absolutely pander in this disgraceful way the way Obama and everybody else is doing for the Jewish vote, so-called. I don't think there is such a thing as a single monolithic Jewish vote. I think a lot of Jewish American voters could also be appealed to by the very essence of the one state because it's precisely along the lines that American Jews have long historically argued for in this country and in other contexts too, equal rights and civil liberties and so forth. So there's a lot going on that I think is not just, uh, that, is, that is th will take more to digest and work through, but I think there's a lot, a lot at stake in your question, so thank you for the questions. But to come back to the other question, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it really is important at this stage for Palestinians to speak with, with one voice. Uh, about what it is that they want, and to be able to have their version of the Freedom Charter that does embrace the rights of Israelis and say, this is what we want, and, and to articulate it in, in, a, in a unified way. How easy it'll be, I don't, obviously I can't say, but I can say, I think it's fair to say, that increasingly it's the case, and again, the sense that the one state has been put on the world agenda is, I think, evidence of this. I think it's fair to say that the old sort of institutionalized presence of people like Mahmoud Abbas is gradually being, or even has already been eclipsed by a new emergent Palestinian movement that has nothing to do with the PLO or the PA or Fatah or Hamas and has, is moving in totally different directions in spite of them. So who knows what the coming months will bring in terms of either revivified revivify PLO, if that's possible, or in terms of some uh, uh, popular set of protests sweeping the occupied territories and inside Israel, the refugee camps and exile the borders, all those kinds of talks about a million person march, those are, one hears a lot about that kind of thing. All those things are, are potential out there. So I don't know what the future will bring. I mean, all I know is that all these mobilizations are happening and we should look for ways to connect them together and, and build on them. <laughs>